And not a lot of people realize that the first intended target of Lee Harvey Oswald was General Edwin Walker, and he actually took the shot from behind the house in this alleyway at around 9.30 p.m., but another issue kind of surfaces here. See, Oswald was friends with a shady Russian immigrant named George de Morenschild. Met Lee Harvey Oswald in the summer of 1962 in Fort Worth. A wealthy oilman, he claimed he'd been introduced by a Russian accountant who thought he'd like to meet the Belarusian woman he was living with. It's also important to point out that George was related to Russian nobility and very conservative, and also an active member of several right-wing groups and a CIA informant at times. A fact which often gets left out is the fact that George and Marina Oswald both have Belarusian backgrounds, which would be akin to two Idahoans running into each other in Russia, a novelty at the very least. This is what most likely is the reason for the oil accountant introducing them. He quickly became aware of the fact that Lee Harvey was a communist and spoke to intelligence agents who assured him he was just a loony. George was friendly with Marina and just let Lee rant about communism, to which Lee felt he'd made a new good friend. He seems to have given George de Morenschild a manuscript to read sometime around around October 1962. George left it in his Dallas home and took a weekend trip to Houston. When he returned, he found that his house had been broken into and documents had been scattered around. He immediately suspected that it was the CIA's doing, and this was something the CIA flatly denied. He also suspected they may have photocopied Oswald's manuscript. Around that time, Lee Oswald told George that he'd been fired from his job in Fort Worth, and a short time afterwards, he was hired to Jaggers Charles Stovall, a photography firm in Dallas. George's wife and daughter later confirmed that the job was arranged for by him. Oswald probably realized this and felt that their friendship was deeper than it really was, but for George, I'd imagine it was akin to a Japanese person befriending an American weeaboo, someone of obsessed with their culture. For him, the friendship with Oswald was a novelty and a curiosity, and Marina was just somebody that he wanted to get to know more because they were both from the same general area. In February 1963, General Edwin Walker, who lived across town, began Operation Midnight Ride, an anti-communist tour around Texas. As a result of our tour from coast to coast, there's been much response to uh, what's been said on this tour. The people are very much interested and quite upset across the land. It's very indicative that they are not being properly represented in Washington, D.C. Around the same time, Marina and Lee were at a party with George when Lee began to talk about Walker and what he was getting up to. George offhandedly remarked that anyone who killed him would be a hero, probably just playing along with Lee's delusions and smirking at Marina, who understood how crazy her husband was. But Lee nodded back in contemplation. He thought it was a sort of message. On March 12, 1963, Lee Oswald ordered a Carcano rifle and began to train with it. On the weekend of March 9th and 10th, Oswald would take photographs of Walker's home and ran practice drills to look for getaways. At around the same time, Oswald also photographed himself holding the Carcano rifle and copies of a socialist magazine, a photo of which he would sign with his name and the phrase Oswald, hunter of fascists, and he would present his friend George de Morenschild a copy, and George probably, again, laughed at it. But on the evening of April 10th, around 9.30 p.m., a shot rang out from the alleyway behind Walker's house. Some say it was Oswald, others say it wasn't. General Walker would come to believe that it was Oswald with an accomplice. Someone had taken the shot from 75 yards away, resting at a fence, and missed the top of Walker's head by less than an inch. The general claimed that it went through his dining room window, but that's an obvious lie. News footage shows it was on the second floor study adjacent to his bedroom. Well, the police from the city came in to investigate a rifle shot that was fired into the house, fired through the west window, and hit the cell and hit the wall across the room and went through the wall over the desk at which I was sitting. This happened at 9 o'clock at last. Here is a police officer that night who rushed to Walker's home. He's examining the hole made in a window frame of Walker's second floor study. The general was sitting at his desk making out his income tax return. The bullet missed his head by inches, bore through a nine-inch wall, and settled in the adjoining room. The reasons for this lie will become obvious later on in the narrative. Oswald escaped back home. How he got there is a mystery because he couldn't drive, but he arrived there looking spooked. 
This is where things begin to get a little bit weird. The official narrative says that Lee Harvey Oswald, because he'd practiced for days, decided after taking one shot and getting incredibly spooked because Walker hit the deck and the bullet looked like it went right through his head, he ran, buried his gun, followed the railroad tracks for a little ways, got into his car, and then went back to his home. However, Lee Harvey Oswald couldn't drive a vehicle, and that was pointed out by Ruth Payne, a woman who was a friend of Lee Harvey Oswald's wife, Marina. Now, what was reported in this house? Edwin Walker had a friend who was with him late at night in his study named Bob Surrey. Do you see where this is going? Hyper-conservative right-wing candidate with a close friend in basically his bedroom, and Surrey said he saw two men skulking in the alleyway and specifically his backyard for several minutes. And apparently Surrey, seeing this from the window of the second floor, went downstairs to confront them. But they ran down the alley, got in a car, and drove off. Now, her, who are these two men? If it was Oswald, did he have an accomplice? And if Oswald had an accomplice, he would have known that he had those intentions. And, and I guess moving back to some of the uh, later conspiracies, uh, so in one of those theories about the JBS in Dallas and conservatives in Dallas, he mentions Congressman John Russolo mm -hmm. and General Edwin Walker. Mm -hmm. I'm especially interested in General Walker. Uh, did you know any of these? Did you know either of them? I knew who they were. Uh, met both of them. Uh, can you give me your thoughts, especially on General Walker, because he's a fascinating guy? Well, okay, let me give you just a quick one on Russo. Russo was from California, uh, Southern California, and the Birch Society had grown very strong there, particularly in Southern California, and he ran for Congress and won, and won re-election several times, and more or less became the uh, conservative voice that was growing in uh, uh, the Republican Party at that time, which Ron Paul later moved into that, that sphere. And, some other ones too. Uh, General Walker was uh, head of our troops over uh, in an element in Europe and uh, lived in Dallas. Uh, came back and uh, was living in Dallas at that time. And uh, now this is what's interesting. There was, uh, he was speaking out uh, about the communist uh, and uh, the spread of communism in Europe and uh, the coddling of con congressmen, uh, co the communists, they called it there. Well, there's an enemy within this country, and of course it's the same enemy that uh, represents the position that we should do away with the House and american Activities Committee, that we should destroy our local police forces, and that we should uh, do away with our military forces. These are the... Uh, you might say the anti-Americans, as far as our traditions, heritage, and constitution are concerned, and there are plenty of them in this country, in spite of the federal government's position, that there is no uh, <coughs> threat from within. There is a threat from within. And uh, living in his house, and there was an attempt on his life. That, uh, actually, they shot and missed him, is what they, they might, might not do, but it was an attempt on his life. And uh, that kind of rattled him. Uh, Do you know who uh, tried shooting at him? No, nope, nobody ever know. We don't know to this day who it was. You know, the, uh, I believe, congressional investigation into JFK said that was Oswald. Uh, I've heard that, but I, you, that's all. You can't connect anything up there. Uh, yeah, they saw two people leaving in separate cars running after they heard the shot, and Oswald didn't have a driver's license and didn't know how to drive. Yeah, I've heard that story, but uh, boy, trying to prove it or disprove it's tough. Uh, you just have to, you know, keep it there as something to consider. More specifically, he seems to have dashed down this alleyway behind his house, moved along Avondale Avenue onto Fitzhugh Avenue closer to town, and buried his rifle on the Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad, now the Katy Trail. He was probably able to hail a cab here while Walker took his time in calling the police.
He began burning all of the photos of Walker's house and the plans in his bathtub under the impression that he'd actually killed the general. Marina hid in her cookbook a note he had written her and sealed, telling her not to open it until after 10 days if he went missing that night. She felt it was important, and she actually had some inkling of an idea that he was trying to kill somebody. So she was saving that for the police in case Oswald did end up dead. Oswald later told her he tried to kill the general, but Marina probably nervously dismissed it because Oswald liked to take credit for anything and everything. Four days later, George de Morinchild and his wife Jenny visited Lee and Marina's apartment. The wife spotted the rifle leaning on the wall and pointed it out to George, who laughed and jokingly asked Oswald, quote, were you the one who took a pot shot at General Walker? Oswald smiled, and George felt unnerved, but supposedly hid that feeling, later telling the CIA about the interaction, even before JFK was killed. He claims the incident ruined him, and in June, five months before the same Carcano rifle killed JFK, George moved from Dallas to Haiti, where he would live for years. He would kill himself years later on the same day that he gave an interview to a journalist in which he expressed his opinion that he would never have contacted Oswald if the CIA didn't initiate that contact. And he he felt like he was a sort of pawn. He was served with a business card on the same day from the House Select Committee on Assassinations who wanted to use him as a key witness, and he returned home and shot himself. However, Edwin Walker, ever the anti-communist, was stirring the CIA's pot himself by attacking Adlai Stevenson. I actually interviewed Henry Rodriguez, a paratrooper, in that failed Bay of Pigs invasion about their apprehension towards JFK and particularly their disdain for Stevenson. And what I found out was basically these guys didn't hate JFK, but if there was somebody that was responsible and that they knew who to blame, it was Adlai Stevenson. Um, I've read people who say that Adlai Stevenson... Oh, he's the one that, he's the one that just caused us to go down. Well, um, do you think, because he was uh, walking in London and he had a massive heart attack, do you think that was natural or do you think maybe... Well, I don't want to go into those disputes. <laughs> the, the thing is that, you see, in those days, I mean, we still have it, but not that much, we have a rivalry between the CIA, the State Department, you know, and so on. And the CIA did not communicate and let the State Department know things. See, so Stevenson looked like a fool at the United Nations because one of our planes was damaged and he landed uh, Key West or somewhere and he, the, he was restored to say, I'm asking for political asylum. I'm a pilot from Castro. So, so Stevenson went to the United Nations <clears throat> and said, some of your pilots are defecting and so on. And, uh, he was not aware of what's wrong. So he looked like a total fool when then Roa, who was the, uh, the uh, Minister of, um, of Affairs for, for Cuba, he said, proof that that fellow is that you're totally lying in front of you. So Stevenson went to the White, to the White House and told uh, Kennedy, I demand that you stop the bombing, if, if not, I resign. And that's where Kennedy, he would have had, he was said, well, fine, resign, but that's right then and there, we lost. So, if you were to blame one person for the failure, it would I'd be... I'd like to see 